Right. Oh, we. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Dong Kwai or Dong Kui. Dong Kwai, the real, that's how it's pronounced. Spelled in America, the real spelling is Dong Kui. Kui. So this is this beautiful, pass this around, this beautiful root, you know, when you buy it from American companies, it's just chopped up in pieces, but it's like artwork to me, it's so beautiful. This is like light. So this is the top of the plant, right? This is the root. So when we talk about Dong Kwai in Chinese medicine, we get really geeky about it. This is called the head of the dong kwai, just this top or little part. Um, sometimes we order or we'll use just the head. This is like when you order, when you buy this in America, you can't do this. You just buy this whole thing. Uh, but in from Chinese pharmacies and things, and in some Chinese formulas, we sometimes specify just the head. So the head of the dong kwai is considered the most blood building, strengthening to the blood, so like anemia and blood deficiency, right? Those symptoms are going to be the ones we've talked about a lot, blood deficiency, going to have dry skin, dry hair, dry nails, thin hair, um, dry bowels, constipation, because everything's dry, right? Vaginal dryness, eye dryness, sinus dryness, like everything's going to be dry um, from the blood being too weak to nurture, right? And we'll have a lot of anemia signs, like fatigue, brain fog. Sometimes the blood can get so weak that it, in Chinese medicine, we'll say it can't move. So then we get circulation problems, we get circulation blockages because the blood is too weak to move. So we have to move the blood. So in Chinese medicine, um, this herb is only slightly worn. Its directionality is most definitely outward, but it never really overheats. In fact, this is going to be our main, one of the most classic menopausal herbs of all time. So we have the slice of the Dong Kui looks like this. This is just kind of nerding out, right? We have the head. Um, sometimes we, I mean, I've rarely used just the head of it. That would be used just for the blood deficiency. This is the body. And sometimes we have just the tail or the bottom part. Just about this little part. And sometimes when you buy it, it's the whole, they just chop the bottom off. It looks like a little finger, basically. It looks like someone's little pinky cut off. So this, the top part, the head builds the blood, the bottom part moves the blood. Okay, so this we use more for blood stagnation and circulation blockages like cold hands and feet, Raynaud syndrome, chronic pain, where people have pains in their hands and feet, and so nerve pain, uh, trauma pain, surgery pain, pain from injuries, we would sometimes use just the tail. The only way we mostly use this in Chinese medicine now is this is used, this tail is used a lot in like trauma elements or like broken bones and car accidents and bruises and things like that for trauma. But otherwise we don't really use it a lot. Usually we just use the whole thing. They say the middle part, the part we usually use in America Tonifies. This is one of the only herbs on the planet, by the way, the planet that is a blood tonic. 
and also treats blood stagnation. So it moves the blood and it also nurtures the blood. If you remember when we talked about circulation, there's this idea in natural medicine that when we move your blood, that like takes a little bit of energy. It can drain people, right? It can be fatiguing. Um, so sometimes when we move the blood, we want to make sure we're strengthening the blood. This is where Chinese medicine gets so nuanced and like very sophisticated. Checks and balances, right? So what's great about Dong Kwai is it's always the answer. Is the blood weak? Yep, Dong Kwai. Is the blood stuck or stagnant or circulation? Yes. Is it both? Yes. It just it treats all of it. So you never, never a wrong answer with it, right? Kind of like ashwagandha. When is it wrong? Like it's hardly ever the wrong answer, right? Because it calms the nervous system, strengthens the organs. So a very unique plant in that sense. Um, so we're going to use it for pretty much all disorders of anemia, blood deficiency. Remember in Chinese medicine, when your blood is weak, that also means all your hormones are weak. Because remember, blood is how hormones are working in your body. Without strong blood, hormones don't get to where they need to go. They don't work right. They don't get produced right, right? So often women that have low estrogen, low progesterone, low testosterone are usually blood deficient. Their blood is weak. And the same way with men too. A lot of men that have um, low testosterone and that also have weak blood. So even though this is often considered like America a female herb because we use it so much for menopause, it's really for men, women, children. There's, you know, we don't remember, we really understand herbs. There is no like men's herbs or women's herbs or prostate herbs, right? It just herbs affect so many parts of the body. Yeah. Does it work with high estrogen too or just low estrogen? This would just be low everything. But not the high estrogen. Not necessarily good for high, for usually for high estrogen, we use liver herbs, right? To help the liver metabolize the excess estrogens. Okay. So I'll pass this around. It's really cool. It smells like barbecue. Remember, that's one of the country ways of knowing if people are anemic or blood deficient. Number one, they like to chew ice. That's a classic clinical sign. Number two, they love barbecue and they crave barbecue sauce. The barbecue sauce with flat strap molasses in it, and that's like a very rich blood tonic. So often people that crave barbecue sauce, or if you ever have a period of your like year where you're like, I must have barbecue. It's usually because your blood's gotten like a little bit weak. So I don't eat cat. I'm like no condiment guy personally, but like occasionally I will have to have like barbecue sauce. I'll pass this around. It's really beautiful herb though. It's very, very beautiful. Okay. So it's warm, but it rarely overheats. So how we're going to use this herb First, we're going to use this for in gynecology when the blood is weak. What is the most dramatic sign your blood is weak as a woman? Often thin, very pale. Like we said, your hair will be thin and falling out. Your hands will be cold. Your body will look very pale. Your fingernails will look very pale, right? Your tongue will look how? Pale, right? Um, you will feel very tired and weak and fatigued. If your blood is extremely weak, then we start to get the anemia signs like shortness of breath, feel like you can't breathe, extreme fatigue, mental exhaustion. All those are like classic blood deficiency signs. Okay. And when we say blood deficiency, again, remember, we're not necessarily saying you have anemia. Anemia is on a spectrum of what we call blood deficiency. Anemia could be part of that. It might not be. 
but the most extreme sign that we have that we instantly know um, a woman has extreme blood deficiency is we have lack of a menstrual cycle because there's not enough blood to actually make a cycle. This is so when we see like younger women, middle-aged women, in fact, younger girls who don't start their cycle or stop their cycle, it's often, this often happens with like anemia, eating disorders, extreme sports activities where like in gymnasts where kids are not really eating enough to keep up with all of their calorie expenditure or you know, eating disorders, we're gonna see women lose the ability to have a menstrual cycle. That's one of the most important signs to look for. Uh, especially when we see patients that have that, we want to really educate about that, right? Okay, but also when your blood is weak, your whole body's got to ache. You're going to see black spots. You're going to see the little floaters, right? That's a very classic sign. Gonna be. So, so we're going to use this in gynecology, believe it or not, for women who are perimenopausal, menopausal, is especially good for hot flashes. If a female has a history of anemia, guess what? We just automatically think of Don Quine. If someone's been anemic as a child, as a younger college age life, you know, 30s and 40s, Anyone who's had anemia as a female and then has hot flashes during menopause, usually don't quite is the greatest herb for managing this. So, so we're going to use this for menopausal hot flash, especially when we know someone has all this fatigue symptom, anemia symptoms, the skin is dry, and especially their tongue is pale. Their face is kind of pale. So, like in Ayurvedic medicine, Vata women, almost all Vata women are blood deficient or prone to it. So, this is a very important menopause herb for Vata or thin, thin build women. Okay. So, we're also going to use it when people have a cycle that has stopped. And we're also going to use it for, um, for women as they go through menopause as their cycle naturally stops, right? Is it common for women during menopause or post-menopause to take this and then have another cycle out of the blue? It can, that's not a bad sign. Sometimes it's just because the blood builds, the hormones kind of have a little bit of a flushing effect. So women who have even stopped their cycles will, can sometimes have like this spotting or a small cycle after they stop, start the surge. Now, you won't go back to like having monthly cycles, but um, have to be aware of that. <laughs> the only concern about this herb in gynecology is that it does move the blood too. So if, if a woman is bleeding excessively through her menstrual cycle, or she's having like, fibroids or cysts that are bleeding profusely. We're careful with this herb because it moves the blood. So it can potentially um, make the bleeding more excessive. That's the only time we get really concerned about this plant. So if you were taking it as a female and you tended to have heavy periods, would you just not take it during that week? Or would you just not take it at all? I just personally would not take it at all, or I would put it in a formula with other things like ladies mantle that's really like astringent. Because not surprisingly in Chinese medicine, we do use this for heavy cycles too, but really specifically only when sometimes that can be caused. I don't even want to throw that out there. What is this? But it's always like there's the exception to the rule in Chinese medicine, right? But in general, just be cautious about it. The only known drug interaction with this is potentially this could interact with blood thinners because it does make your blood less thick and less clotted. One absolute magical use of this herb that I wish 
all American herbalists knew better that is well known in Chinese medicine is that this is the herb we do to open the pelvis. Or so for women that have any kind of ovarian problems, uterine problems, fibroids, cysts, um, women who have what we call pelvic insufficiency, women who have a lack of blood flow into the pelvis, or men, anybody who's been traumatized in your abdomen, anybody who's had abdominal surgery, hernia surgery, ovary removed, you know, gynecology, exploratory surgery, any kind of surgery in the abdomen, this is one of the main herbs we do for recovery. But also for women or men who have poor circulation in their pelvis. So for men, this is going to show up as probably prostate problems that are really chronic and hard to treat. For women, this is going to show up usually of chronic pelvic floor pain, pelvic dysfunction, um, every pelvic floor physical therapist in America should know this herb because it's one of the greatest herbs for pelvic pain, pain in the pelvis, um, because it opens all the blood flow into the hips. Also, it's good for like hip pain, lower back pain. So it's quite an amazing herb. It's almost as legendary as Kiesel. So it's used a lot for pains that are caused by blood deficiency. Yeah. You said it, it interacts with blood thinners or it thins the blood? It could potentially interact with blood thinners. But it doesn't actually thin the blood. It doesn't actually thin the blood, but it might make those drugs work a little bit too well. Okay. So we don't use it if people are on blood thinners. That's the only Did you put anything in there? It tastes surprisingly yeah. sweet. Just decocted the all day, and then I had the. Yeah, she put this spell so good in here. The I had a base going. So Donghui is in the celery family. It has that really distinctive, like weirdish. I'll pass this bottle around. You'll smell it. Just close your eyes. You'll get like hints of celery right away. It's like celery with barbecue sauce. To me, is what it smells like in a cake. Just, it's cooking yeah. celery and barbecue sauce and a cane. This is what it smells like. <laughs> so if you're tasting for the celery with your barbecue, is that easily? No, like some very... people love the smell of Dong Kwai and it's almost like infinitely. Yeah, like I think I've dated in college like three or four women who every time they came to my house they're like, it smells like celery in here because of <laughs> Dong Kwai, right? Okay, so we're going to use this for menopause, perimenopause, postmenopause, any kind of menopausal symptom, night sweats, hot flashes. It is weird that it's kind of warming, but it cools the body. Okay, it's also good for, because of it moves the blood, we also use it for pain in the abdomen for women. So menstrual cramps, menstrual pains, um, pains with fibroids or cysts. Use this a lot for pains with tumors. But not women. cramps. No cramps too. Cramps. Yep. Is it better than cramp bark? It works different than cramp bark. It works really well combined with cramp bark because cramp bark is more of a relaxant, where this more is like building the blood and invigorating the blood. Okay, so anytime the tongue looks purple or blue or pale, don't cry, it's always a good choice. Okay, uh, because it's a blood tonic, we're also going to use it in hematology. So for people that have low iron, have all the symptoms of anemia, people who maybe are doing their best to build their iron, but it's just not building up. You know, they're taking supplements, they're eating iron, but it's just not happening. This is surprisingly one of the more researched herbs that we use. Um, this was uh, figured out in Chinese oncology hospitals in the 80s. This herb actually builds your platelet counts, hemoglobin and hematocrit when people are going through chemotherapy and radiation. 
So it shows up in a lot of chemotherapy radiation protocols. It has phytoestrogens in it, which we've talked about a lot. It's a really controversial, misunderstood topic. So again, this plant does not have estrogen in it, despite what some researchers and medical people try to say when they read things like that. It has phytoestrogens in it. And we'll, we'll talk about that eventually. We've talked about it some, haven't we? Mm -hmm. The phytoestrogen controversy and the mis more misinformation. Okay. Um, it has oddly been shown to improve liver function when people's liver has been damaged by Tylenol. Um, probably other drugs too. It shows up in a lot of like hepatitis formulas. This is especially true like if someone would have like liver disease and really low blood counts, this herb would be super appealing. And it pairs well with ashwagandha, as you said earlier. Mm-hmm, pairs well with ashwagandha. Pairs well with so many different things that are totally opposites, right? So maybe we'll do some pairings. Yeah. What about shizandra berry? Yeah. So this is, um, because this herb is blood building, and when we talked about the adrenals, remember blood deficiency is one of the many types of like adrenal fatigue or fatigue we can have. So this herb often combines well with other adrenal herbs for fatigue, especially for women, especially people that are kind of more blood deficient. So it combines really well, like I said, with ashwagandha for building the blood. Let's do some pairs real quick. I wasn't going to do that, but let's do some pairs. So for poor circulation, this herb is amazing combined with cinnamon. Or rosemary. If we wanted something cooling, then we could say yarrow. For menopause, this herb is great combined with black cohosh, white pink, or vitex. For anemia, Herb is really good combined with metal and iron supplement. For liver disease, herb is really combined, good combined with milk thistle. Okay. For pelvic pain, like this would be like for women that have pelvic floor pain and pelvic floor physical therapy. This herb is best combined with black cohai. It's also really good for pelvic pains. For adrenal fatigue and fatigue, this herb can be really combined with any adaptogen, but it especially works really well with ashwagandha. And the classic Chinese combination is ginseng, Chinese ginseng with donghuai. And the ginseng builds your chi and your vitality, that part of your adrenals. And the Dong Kwai builds blood. So most Chinese tonics that are for the adrenals will have something like Chinese ginseng root combined with Dong Kwai root because one builds the, the chi or your energy and one builds your blood. And they'll add all kinds of other stuff to it, but that's like the basis of it. Okay. What's the third one down? Under pelvic pain? Yeah. Metabots. Oh, metabots. For hair loss and like hair, losing hair, this combines well with Koshu Wu. That's a legendary tonic for weak, thin, 
hair, hair that's graying too quickly, hair that's falling out. What do we call this in Chinese medicine when we have these herbal pears? Remember the Chinese name? Remember? We gal. We gal. For chemotherapy and radiation, we often combine this herb with schizandra berry and astragalus root. Uh, there's thousands of combinations. These are some of my favorites. Okay, questions on that? And you can take the schizandra at stragulus and dump it throughout the chemo and radiation. It depends on the chemo. Every chemo would be different. So if it's like a lung cancer with immune... Yeah, we have to look at every one and look all that up. But I mean, in general, yeah, especially the older chemos, the newer immune therapy, uh, they're they're less reactive, so there's less worries. Yeah. So, yeah. And first, with the most standard, you have Shazandra and the Stragos that was for Shazandra and Stragos would be for like chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For radiation exposure. <laughs> This herb also, because it increases blood flow and builds the blood, is really good for, you guessed it, in martial arts. This with Kizel, this is like something that's never talked about. In Western herbalism, oh, people don't even talk about this kind of stuff. We should. Um, for flexibility of joints, like people that have stiff joints and joints that have been replaced and stiff and all these mm -hmm. things, we use Dong Kwai combined with what? Teasel yeah. for joint to make the joints actually more flexible and limber. Chinese people. And for constipation. We can combine this with all kinds of things. I mean, probably my all-time favorite is yellow dock, right? The yellow dock is a blood builder and helps us absorb iron. And the dong kwai, dong kwai is really good for people that have really dry bowels, like what we call blood deficient bowel, which means the stools are gonna be really dry hard, firm, and like really painful to pass because they're so hard. Not rabbit pellets, right? Rabbit pellets are from tension. And this is like the stool is just really dry, really hard, very hard to pass. This is like when the elderly people get severely constipated, it's because the blood gets so weak. That fiber, and, you know, often this dehydration is more common, like in nursing homes and that, too, because they're not hydrated very well. And elderly people, like constipation, can just be like this a constant medical management issue, right? That they use, like, constant enemas and, you know, even more invasive things than that sometimes, right? So that's, that's a pretty cool herb, right? So it's also used for eye problems because it helps blood flow through the eyes and everywhere. So um, it's also a major cardiovascular herb. I forgot about that. So we use it for a weak heart. We use it to help people recover from heart surgery. Um, we also use it for dizziness and vertigo when people have like a really weak heart, recovering from a heart attack. This is used a lot after recovery from heart surgery in Asia. The only challenge is we just don't do it with if someone's on a blood thinner, right? Is that normal to be on a blood thinner after you are recovering from like heart surgery? Big heart surgery, yeah, it's common to be on a blood thinner. Yeah, or you've had like a stent or something. Mm -hmm. 
This is one of our best herbs with the heart too for poor circulation to the hands and feet, the Raynaults. Also neuropathies, right? This is a great herb for neuropathy. It's really a cool plant. It's kind of like teasel. Like this is probably one of the oldest, most written about herbs in Chinese history, second only to Chinese ginseng. This is probably the most, in fact, throughout ancient times, this is called women's ginseng. And it's very common, you know, in older times that pretty much every or most any female in Asia would know they just start, some women just take down quiet their entire life. It helps their cycle, it helps the cycle be regular, helps menopause and perimenopause and everything. Is it a nervine? Not a nervine at all. No, but it still helps with neuropathy. Mm -hmm. It helped the nerve by helping blood flow and that. Mm -hmm. Did you mix it with eyebright or eye issues? Or what you, you could mix it with eyebright. Typically, we'll mix it more with like blueberry or bilberry for eye blood vessels. Mm -hmm. There's so many things you could do with it. There's all, all kinds of other uses too. Um, we could talk a lot more about it, but in general, this is one of the legendary, it's not a true adaptogen, it's not usually classified that way, but to me, it really is, because it is adaptogenic, it is energizing, it fits that criteria that I have, and it, it, so it is an adaptogen, it's often not mentioned in that way, though. And how this is used a lot in Asia, this is used a lot of cooking. Well, it's added to chicken soup. It's added to all kinds of soups and kongi, like rice porridges, like when women would be having menstruation or after pregnancy, this would be used. Oh, because this moves the blood, the only other concern is we don't use this during pregnancy. It is used in China and hospitals all the time, but it's just like a little bit risky to use. Okay. Okay, everybody's good with the old dongweed? Dongweed? Dongweed. But yeah, it's often cooked with black chicken as one of those special foods that activates it. And for those of you who have never been, ate a lot of Asian food, there's actually a black chicken. Not called that because it's like food color is black. Skin is black, it's meat is black. It has to buy it at the Asian grocery store. It's got claws on it and everything. That's the black chicken we cook in like tonic soups and adaptogen soups. This is so. This is like a, like in Chinese, you know, stocks would be different than in America. You know, America we just have like celery and what do we put in stocks? Sometimes potatoes and like you know carrots, mm -hmm. things like that. Where in Asia they would make a stock, but it'd be more like the chicken and all the parts. But then it would have all the herbs cooked into it. So you make like this broth that you drink that's kind of like a tea broth hybrid. So, okay. Questions on the old dong gui? Anything? Um, about like day four or five of the liver cleanse. Uh -huh. like all these bruises where my veins were blown like mm -hmm. 11 years ago started coming up. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're going away. Mm -hmm. they're, most of them were like yellowish when they, I mean, they, mm -hmm. but I know that's what they were because I looked mm -hmm. at them for three years. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like that congested feeling in my legs, like can't even sleep at night. Yeah. And I, today I just started having the black thing. Yeah. Or should I just take this for Yeah, dinner? you should take, you should take the for a while, like okay. right around. The good thing about Dong Kwai is it works really good as a capsule, pretty cheap. 
It works really good as a tea and it works great as a tincture. The tincture, when you do the tincture of it, it's ability to move your blood is a little bit stronger. When you drink a tea of it, the ability to like build your blood is a little bit more pronounced. But in general, they're all used similar, but there's a couple of nerdy nuances. So I love how this tastes. So like just do this so and it. It. Yeah, uh, just do the tea if you really like it. Just do a cup once or twice a day. Are there any contraindications? Contraindications, like we said, okay. just pregnancy and blood thinning medication. Yeah. No others. And safe for all ages. Safe for all ages. Okay. I mean, it wouldn't be something you would give in mega doses to children, you know, especially like younger girls that could potentially like stimulate a cycle if you did like a mega dose of it. But you know, just adding that in formulas and things is totally fine for all ages. Okay. So when you say build the blood, that means that it will, does it actually create more white blood cells, white blood cells, platelets like Ashwagandha does? It can, yeah. It can increase all those actual lab indicators. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just strengthens blood mm -hmm. really bad. The matrix of the blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's used a lot in Chinese medicine. It has a long history of, uh, there's this Chinese like folklore tale that I can never remember if it's to a point. That's really cool. I'll have to try to find it. But the gist of it is it's now used for basically postpartum depression. It's a very specific remedy for it. We always give this to women after delivery. And also just, you know, menopausal depression and postmenopausal depression. It's this long story, it's this beautiful Chinese story about uh, um, a woman who waited for her lover and never, yeah, it's like a tragic story, but it's, it's somehow intertwined in deeper meanings of the Don't Goliath. I just butchered it for you. That's like a seven page story. I've tried to memorize it before. I'm like, I just can't memorize stuff like that. So that's the gist. <laughs> like, cross cultural brain is always like, what does this mean? What are they talking about here? What do they really mean? Okay. Um, but all kinds of other applications. It, it's also used a lot in Chinese medicine. You'll see it in all kinds of fibromyalgia formulas because it increases blood flow to your muscles, all kinds of arthritis formulas because it increases blood flow like to your joints. Very good just when you have blocked blood flow to your legs. Just sitting here thinking like, like every week, why am I not <laughs> thinking this herb more? It's like every week that's a theme, right? I should be doing this. Okay, everybody's okay with going fly? Okay.